Good evening, everyone, and welcome to WBUR's virtual town hall. I'm Kimberly Atkins, WBUR's Washington-based senior news correspondent. And thank you all for joining us for our discussion on the racial disparities that have been revealed and exacerbated by the coronavirus pandemic. It is the latest in a series of town halls we have hosted on important subjects, and you can subscribe to WBUR's YouTube channel to get notified anytime we release a new video. You can also click the bell icon right next to the subscribe button if you want to be notified whenever we go live. Tonight, we're focusing not only on the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on communities of color in terms of the disproportionately high infection and death rates, we're examining the inequalities that exist in the nation's healthcare and economic systems that put people of color at higher risk of COVID-19 and also the, co the comorbidities that make the virus more deadly. Our guests are three leaders with deep knowledge and understanding of the issues, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, Dr. Paula A. Johnson, and Dr. Mary T. Bassett, who all join us via Skype. The purpose of these town halls uh, is to highlight an issue. It's not meant to be a debate, but rather a discussion uh, between our panelists and you, our audience. We're grateful that you're joining us tonight, and we want to hear your perspectives in this discussion. And we're taking questions on Slido.com. You can go to Slido.com and enter the event code WBURVTH9. That's WBURVTH9. We've already had lots of great questions submitted, uh, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. And you can also go to the YouTube channel, the live chat feature, to talk with others who are watching and exchanging ideas. And let's introduce our guests now. Ayanna Presley represents Massachusetts' 7th Congressional District in the U.S. House of Representatives, the state's only majority-minority congressional district, and she is the state's first elected black congresswoman. She was previously a Boston City Councilor, the first woman of color elected to the council in its 100-year 100 100-year 100 history, a lifelong community mm. activist, and former senior aide to Congressman Joseph Kennedy II and Senator John Kerry, Presley's work has focused particularly on combating inequities and disparities facing the communities she represents and throughout the country. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Mary T. Bassett is director of the Francois Xavier Bagnode uh, Center for Health and Human Rights and professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Bassett previously served as commissioner of health for New York City. She also served as a program director for the African Health Initiative and Child Wellbeing Program at the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Dr. Bassett has more, of th more than 30 years of experience in public health and has focused her career on advancing health equity. Dr. Bassett, welcome. Thank you. Glad to Paula, be here. Great. Paula A. Johnson is the 14th president of Wellesley College and the first black woman to serve in that role. She's also a cardiologist whose career in medical research, public health and education has focused on improving health care for women and advancing policy changes so that so that research includes information on sex differences so that gender biases can be uncovered. Dr. Johnson previously founded and served as the inaugural executive director of the Connor Center for Women's Health and Gender Biology and was chief of the Division of Women's Health both at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. All right, so I want to first talk about uh, data. A little later in our discussion, we're going to talk about the causes of the disproportionate impact on people of color and also some solutions. But I want to start this discussion uh, with a really foundational issue, which is data about race, uh, about the coronavirus. Dr. Johnson, for those who don't really understand the role of data here, help us understand. Tell us why is data so important? Well, data are critical because if we don't have the right data, we can't measure, we don't know exactly where to target our prevention, our therapies, and any intervention. And so it is so critical to have high quality data. And, you know, what we know from this pandemic is that we really have had inadequate data um, from the very beginning. Uh, our data were inadequate with regard to race, with about 50% of the race data missing. And in fact, 
you know, the CDC just really mandated the collection of race data consistently only about a week ago. So it is, it's important to get the full story. And again, not just even in the silos, but to understand, for example, how we intersect race and ethnicity with sex. How do black women do? How do white women, black men, Latinx? So I think it's, it's critically important uh, for us to have good data. And you pointed out that uh, HHS only a week ago mandated laboratories to uh, report and collect race data in testing for the coronavirus. Uh, and uh, just uh, a week before that, uh, during a congressional hearing, CDC Director uh, Dr. Robert Redfield apologized for the agency's slowness in providing this data. But let's take a look at some of the data that we have. We have a chart that is based on uh, the uh, an NPR analysis of data from the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center and the COVID Tracking Project. And it mm -hmm. shows nationally, in the case uh, of Black Americans, you can see in almost every state there is a disproportionate rate of both uh, coronavirus cases and in coronavirus deaths. Now, it's important to know uh, that in this data, 41% of the cases and 42% of the deaths, uh, the data about cases and deaths are unknown. It's not provided. So this is just the data that we have. Uh, and I wanna take a moment to look at the uh, chart on uh, that features uh, Hispanic patients in the United States. There is also a discrepancy there, uh, in particularly in uh, infection rates. It's not as disparate uh, for deaths as it is for black Americans, uh, but it's still, you can still see the differences there. And Dr. Bassett, there was a piece in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, last week saying that while data collection is crucial, it's also crucial how you contextualize that data. And they warned that contextualizing it wrong uh, can actually boost stereotypes about people of color uh, and can lead to uh, pushback and, and uh, even attacks on uh, communities of color. So how do we contextualize this in a way that helps combat these disparities without raising stereotypes about people of color? Well, thanks for that question. And I want to echo and reinforce what Dr. Johnson has said, that we have to start out by having the data. And that's always the first step. And the data were woefully inadequate. And then there's a the question of how we interpret the data, because having the data doesn't guarantee that it will be interpreted in a way that isn't racist, frankly. And racist interpretations, the way to identify them in my mind, is are typically ones that place the problem with the person rather than talking about the environment in which people live and the opportunities that they have or don't have to protect themselves from exposure, the risks that place them at higher risk for having a serious case, the barriers that exist to seeking and obtaining um, adequate health care. So, it's very important that we begin by asking the question, why are we seeing these? And that we always interrogate uh, answers that are like the ones that the Surgeon General gave, like stop smoking and drinking, or even an eminent physician like uh, Dr. Fauci, who said it's all a problem of high rates of other, other common diseases like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, hypertension. Uh, we have to look at the environments that have made it a fact that the legacy of this country's uh, treatment of people of African descent is literally written on our bodies. Uh, Congresswoman Presley, I, I, you have uh, uh, sponsored the Equitable Data Collection and Disclosure on COVID-19 Act. You have been pressing since the beginning of this pandemic uh, for disaggregation of uh, data, including race data, uh, in all reporting, as we have pointed out a number of times, that has yet to uh, be fulfilled, although a part of uh, your legislation was included in the last coronavirus relief package to help uh, bolster the Paycheck Protection Program. But I have a, uh, we have a question from one of our uh, viewers, 
says, I work on a team that's struggling to get quality data on race and COVID-19. No doubt it exists, but how are you tracking the racial divide? Without this full data, Congresswoman, how are you able to do your work in trying to combat these disparities? What do we do in the meantime while we wait for this data to come? Sure, well, it certainly is very challenging, and again, um, you know, because of the sluggish response, the science denials, and what I consider really criminal negligence, and um, press briefings by this administration that more often than not have been disinformation campaigns, we started in the worst position that one would want to be in with a pandemic, and that is behind. And so in mid-March, uh, myself and Senator Warren, um, in partnership with um, several of my colleagues in the Congressional Black Caucus began banging the drum, reaching out to Secretary Azar of Health and Human uh, Services for the need for us to collect racial data in real time. We're already collecting age and gender, but we wanted that collection of, of uh, racial data in real time, disaggregated, publicly reported, so that we can ensure that there was an equitable uh, public health response, both when it comes to access to testing and to treatment. Now, anecdotally, we knew how this would play out given the comorbidities and the impacts of structural racism. And I associate myself with the comments uh, of Dr. Bassett and Johnson um, you know, prior to me. And um, HHS was unresponsive. And so then we introduced legislation uh, which um, was included in the last relief bill. And again, the purpose of this data is not data for data's sake, it's to save lives. It's to get ahead of the problem. It's to uh, target how our resources are coordinated and marshaled. Um, and so it's very challenging to not have it. And, and might I add that uh, Massachusetts was a leader in one of, the one of the first three states to begin collecting and reporting racial data. And it directly informed what our response was in Chelsea. Uh, it directly informed how uh, resources were marshaled uh, in Roxbury, in Mattapan, in Dorchester, and then later in Randolph. You know, all three of those are in the Massachusetts 7th, and uh, these represent uh, some of the highest infection rates per capita in the Commonwealth. So it makes it very challenging. So now we have that federal standard, that congressional mandate, but the first report that we received back was just uh, indefensible. Uh, they provided us a report with antiquated hyperlinks, ostensibly. Um, and so the CDC recognizes that they have been non-compliant. And, you know, that has cost us time and that has cost us lives. So it is very challenging, but at least now there is that uh, congressional mandate. And I serve on the oversight committee. And so we continue to exercise the role of oversight to enforce that standard. Congresswoman, you mentioned Massachusetts. Just about all the black and brown folks in Massachusetts live in your district, the uh, the seventh congressional district. And I want to pull up from that NPR analysis uh, some Massachusetts specific charts first uh, for black people, black patients. You can see that it is a larger share of cases. Uh, of the coronavirus by race than of the population and also a slightly larger share of deaths there. So that disparity exists in the Bay State. Uh, and also if we can look at the data for Hispanic and Latino people uh, within Massachusetts, it's an extremely higher rate uh, of uh, cases yeah. uh, there. We don't sure, see the sure, death sure. disparity. Go ahead. Can I just also just add that you know, we were also not slowing the rate of transmission. So if you look at a community like Chelsea, right. where many, so given the density um, of Chelsea, people could not, if they were presenting with symptoms, even physically distance, right? And so, um, and many of them represent the essential workforce. Many of the residents of Chelsea also dominate the essential workforces. Um, and so, that is another reason why we were seeing those infection rates uh, with the lack of protection in PPE, dominating essential workforces. I mean, only one in five black women and Latinas can even work from home. So there's the comorbidities, the impacts of structural racism, unequal access to health care, and then dominating these essential workforces uh, that were disproportionately being exposed and without protections. I, I really want to underline what you've just uh, pointed out, 
Congresswoman. It, it's so important that we talk about the risks of exposure and that we talk about the, um, the way in which workers who are essential uh, haven't been given the kinds of, uh, of protections, haven't been credited with how important their work is and haven't been given protections that we gave to first responders, to people working in the healthcare delivery system. These are people in warehouses, delivery people, people working as home health workers, low wage, precarious uh, workers who get paid by the hour. And uh, they uh, have been exposed excessively to COVID-19 and uh, they also lack the means to protect themselves. And this, I, you've made a really important point. Yeah, I just want to jump in to say that, you know, this has been a pervasive problem in medicine and science for years. I think that many of us have been struggling, really working to have our research community, our communities that are collecting and reporting data, reporting on studies, to actually routinely, when included, report data by gender and race and, and disaggregate the data. And there is no consistent approach, which really hurts um, our communities of color in so many ways and really does not allow them to get the benefit of all that we've invested. And is this a systemic, how systemic is this problem, Dr. Johnson? I mean, I, I was struck by uh, a statistic uh, from the Census Bureau that the life expectancy of a Boston resident in Back Bay is uh, in the 90s, while the life expectancy of a Boston resident in Roxbury is in the 50s. It's a, you know, I think it's as Dr. Bassett said, the environment and the conditions of the environment and what that produces in terms of what we call these comorbid illnesses. And that heaped with racism, right, which is frequently underlying what these conditions are, has led to just enormous disparities in health and disease. If you look at heart attack rates, let's just say in black women versus white women, uh, you know, heart attacks usually don't happen in women until after the menopause. Well, in black women, the rates of death from heart attacks are actually much higher in women under the age of 50. And so, you know, if you think about it, you could probably follow this on, on any number of disorders. Um, and so these are kind of the chickens coming home to roost in terms of what has happened in our society. You know, I want to turn our, our discussion now to uh, the causes, uh, some specific causes of these disparities. Uh, and Dr. Bassett, I want to go to you after we look at uh, a video. Uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is a member of the White House Coronavirus Task Force, in April at a press conference at the White House talked about uh, the racial disparities with the coronavirus and, and what those causes may be. Let's listen to a bit of that. Health disparities have always existed for the African-American community. But here again with the crisis, how it's shining a bright light on how unacceptable that is. Because yet again, when you have a situation like the coronavirus, they are suffering disproportionately, as Dr. Berg said correctly. It's not that they're getting infected more often. It's that when they do get infected, their underlying medical conditions, the diabetes, the hypertension, the obesity, the asthma, those are the kind of things that wind them up in the ICU and ultimately give them a higher death rate. So when all this is over, and as we said, it will end, we will get over coronavirus, but there will still be health disparities, which we really do need to address in the African-American community. Thanks. Dr. Bassett, what's your response to Dr. Fauci? Well, it was really those remarks, and, and I, I've interacted with and I respect Dr. Fauci, but it was those remarks that made me feel that I needed to start speaking out about the disparities uh, that we're seeing, which emerged, emerged very, very rapidly. Uh, just within weeks of the first death, um, we were already getting signs from local jurisdictions. And he was making the case that has been made for so many years that it's some form of lack of fitness that is driving these disparities. 
and he's leaving out entirely uh, what we has just been described to us about Chelsea, for example, where what was it? One in four, uh, only one in four Latina women were able to to work uh, remotely. Uh, and if you look at who makes up the essential workforce, it's disproportionately people of color. And this notion that there was no difference in exposure was just plain wrong. There was a study done in San Francisco uh, in the Mission District where they found that 90% of people who in a community-based survey were found to be COVID uh, positive, have, uh, have the virus, uh, were, uh, were people who were working outside of the home. And people didn't do that because they thought like, great, I wanna go out there and get on public transport. And they were going out there because they had to work That's to right. make a living to pay the rent, uh, to, you know, and then they were going home to overcrowded households. So the whole exposure part of this is really what has to um, be added to the story because in order to get sick from COVID-19, you first have to get infected and to get infected, you have to be exposed. And that was my problem with Dr. Fauci's framing. Additionally, as, um, Someone else that Dr. Johnson can probably explain better than me. You know, it is true that all the conditions that he reeled off as always part of being black in the United States are conditions related to what it means to be black in the United States, okay. to have a low wage job, to have, uh, you know, difficulty obtaining healthy food um, uh, and, you know, to be at higher rate, a higher risk of having untreated conditions. Uh, all of these uh, should make us realize that it's not natural, even if it's existed for a long time. Absolutely, and I would just add to that. I mean, the, the pre-existing condition here is racism. Mm. Uh, it is corrosive, it is, uh, it is structural. And just let me paint a picture for you. So, you know, you live in a, a intergenerational uh, um, apartment in Chelsea. I, I spoke with one family. There were 12 people living in a, um, a two bedroom apartment. Some that were presenting with symptoms um, were still working and they had no way with which to uh, physically distance. And then you live in a transport, pardon me, <coughs> you live in a transportation desert. And so then the only bus you can take is the 111 bus and you are a frontline essential worker, uh, not feeling well, uh, still having to report to work, and then you're all on the 111 bus, congested, uh, because the bus does not run frequently, because it just sits, it's idle, and again, not slowing the rate of transmission. I had a mother who called me uh, from Roxbury, um, who said, I'm an essential worker, I'm a single mom, because the schools are closed, my daughter's home with me, I don't feel well, and I have no one else to watch my child. I cannot take her to work with me. Representative Presley, can you assure me that if I don't report to work tomorrow, that I will still have a job? And the fact that I could not give her that certainty and that assurance is unacceptable. She didn't She didn't know if she was positive. She did not want to put other people at risk. Um, and she had little recourse or options. And so, you know, now people are getting the memo uh, that these are essential workers, but they've always been essential. We've just treated them as if they are disposable. And that's why we've had to fight for uh, these workforces to, to work at a living wage, to have predictable work schedules, to have um, access to health care. But think about how we would have better weathered this storm if people were already working at a living wage, if we had paid family medical leave, if we had paid sick leave, and, and equal access uh, to quality health care. And then finally, I would say, um, to, um, to the doctor's point around this being in our uh, racism, uh, sort of the imprint of that on our bodies. Um, this is why we have a black maternal mortality crisis. It's why we had a black infant mortality crisis. Again, just challenging those um, one dimensional narratives that get pushed. We know that there, it doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is or education level, that a black woman is still four times more likely uh, to die in childbirth. Now, why do we know that? Because we have the data. And so now we can dedicate and invest the resources and do the research and have um, the supports necessary to change those outcomes. That's why you need the data. It saves lives. Yeah. And it's Dr. So Jessica, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
I'm just going to say, you know, on, on, on everything from the experiences, the ongoing battering of racism, we've been able to see what that looks like biologically. So uh, in, in, your, in your genetic material, there's something called telomeres, which are the genetic material at either end of chromosomes, and it's protective. We know that that decreases over time as you age. And what we know is that for people, particularly if you think about black people who have experienced ongoing stress, the ongoing stress of racism, there's an accelerated aging and those telomeres have decreased. So we can actually see the, the, the biologic aspect of this that manifests itself in disease. And then if you put that together with the unequal treatment when you do actually try to access health care. You know, it's a toxic mix. I wrote recently in an editorial a story about one of our really uh, amazing alums um, from Wellesley, 30 years old, Zoe Mungin, th- working in Brooklyn, my hometown, as a teacher, a brilliant writer. She had asthma, went to the hospital twice, asking for a test, got treated for asthma, but again, told that she was probably having a panic attack and was sent home. Well, guess what? The third time she called an ambulance and we know she was almost immediately intubated upon arrival and never made it. Yeah. Couldn't get transferred to get you know her, her treatment though or get on a trial. But I think this is what living in America, you know, as a person of color, as a black person is. And I want to just really reiterate Representative Presley's point. It does not know a social class. This was everybody from your frontline essential workers to your college graduates. Nobody is immune. That's true. But um, but our risk is socially patterned. Uh, So while, you know, Prince Charles got COVID, the president of Harvard got COVID, but we're seeing these patterns that are are related to the social patterning of risk. And that's preventable. I mean, for me, that's, that's the part that we can't let go of, that we can advocate, as Representative Presley is doing, for living wage, for access to health care, for paid sick leave, for you know, affordable housing, all of these circumstances that made it so risky for the family that you interacted with in Chelsea. Uh, These are things that can be changed. And it's important to say that the the problem isn't with those people. The problem is with these bad societal decisions, these failures to provide adequate protection to everyone. And here we are, the richest country in the world. Sorry to keep going. We have the worst epidemic. Dr. Bassett, I you know appreciate the, <laughs> your insight so very much, and um, you know Kimberly was uh, referencing the census. You know this is one of the reasons actually why I ran for this seat because the Massachusetts Seventh, which is a, a district that has 53% people of color, 40% foreign born, almost 40% single female headed households, is one of the most diverse, dynamic, vibrant districts in the country, and one of the most unequal. Um, again, just reiterating that point that from Back Bay to Roxbury. Um, that life expectancy drops by 30 years. And from Cambridge to Roxbury, median household income by $50,000. So these are deeply entrenched inequities and disparities. And just to reference the census again, um, you know, to your point, uh, Dr. Bassett, in terms of people um, victim blaming or stereotyping and not being honest about the, the structural impacts, you know, here's Chelsea in close proximity to the airport, disproportionately burdened by environmental injustices, high asthma rates, again, a transportation desert. And then we have, um, this is also one of the most undercounted districts in the country in terms of the census. And so grocery stores use census tract information to determine where to open. You know, so all of these things are layered to your point about affordable housing, affordable quality housing, that is a critical determinant of health. So when people talk about, you know, they lament uh, the, the unprecedented hurt we're experiencing and they can't wait to we return to normal. The normal was insufficient, inadequate, and unjust to begin with. You know, in this moment, we have got to be anti-racist, intentional, and deliberate about dismantling uh, structural racism. 
which has resulted in these, uh, these comorbidities. And I want to just uh, take a moment to tell our audience members who may have just tuned in that this is WBUR's town hall on the racial inequities uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I am joined by uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley, Dr. Paula Johnson, and Dr. Mary Bassett. And if you want to submit a question, you can go to slido.com and use event code WBUR. VTH9, WBURVTH9. I want to get to a question uh, from uh, our audience. It's from Beverly Smith, who is a public health professional. She, she asks, uh, having diabetes affects the severity of COVID-19. Is there also more risk of getting infected if you are immunocompromised? What are the implications for people of color? Uh, Dr. Johnson, what do you say to uh, Beverly's question? Um, it, it definitely, being immunocompromised definitely impacts your susceptibility to COVID-19. And as we think about that intersection with race, we know that Blacks, particularly Black women, are actually more likely to have certain of the autoimmune diseases like lupus, for example. So, you know, there, there are, um, as Dr. Bassett said, there are patterns of disease that uh, really um, do intersect with, with COVID. And I wanna talk, Dr. No, Johnson please. A question? I, can yeah. I ask Dr. Johnson a question? Yeah. Um, Dr. Johnson, to your point about um, uh, black and, and Latinx uh, folk going to uh, the hospital seeking treatment um, and being, being turned away. And mm -hmm. uh, we know that that pain is, um, black pain is often something that is delegitimized. It yeah. is, it is yeah. not seen. The space isn't held for it. Could you just offer me, you know, some direction? Whenever I raise this, that people, um, healthcare professionals, and our, and I never want, you know, our, our dedicated um, healthcare workers and doctors um, to feel vilified in any way, um, because they they are our heroes and our sheroes. But people will say to me, "Are you saying that doctors are racist?" You know, could you just speak a little bit to? Uh, what medical students are taught, you know, why, how this is in, embedded, that black pain is often delegitimized and people are sent home um, compromised well, in, their, you know, it, in their lives. Why is that? Yeah, this is something that I've studied since the 1990s. And we've known that these disparities exist. We've known that with similar symptoms, people of color will be turned away that pain is not taken as seriously. And I could go down the list, you know, it takes four times to visit the doctor before you get a diagnosis of lupus, the disease that, that I was just talking about. And I think that we have just not gotten serious about this. We have not taken a scientific rigorous approach to structural racism in our healthcare environment. We have not rigorously looked at it. We have not rigorously examined ourselves and the structures. And the absolute incorrect way to take this is to take it personally, because if you personalize it, then you become defensive. Of course, you are part of it. What we should say is we are part of, um, of the United States of America, and therefore, of course, there's structural racism in our institutions, and therefore, we have to take responsibility, particularly as scientists, and as people in the medical field to rigorously examine what those roots are and how we get to the bottom of it. But we have yet really to do that. Well, I wanna ask a question that we got uh, from a member of the audience that's related to this uh, on Slido. Tom asks, how do healthcare disparities for people of color in the United States compare to those of other countries uh, with more socialized healthcare systems? Yeah. That's a good question. Do we know? Well, I mean, these disparities exist in other racially divided societies in the United Kingdom, for example, which has a national health service in which uh, healthcare access is assured uh, to all of the citizens. They still see disparities and they're seeing huge disparities in, in even in, with COVID. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I think that that speaks to the fact that this can't be fixed by the healthcare delivery system alone, that it has to do with all kinds of, of, um, of, of uh, 
things that we've all talked about, housing, employment, education. Uh, but the healthcare delivery sector is also uh, part of a society which is imprinted with deeply racialized ideas. I mean, even children are less likely to be treated for pain, um, not just adults. Uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the United States. So these divisions are, are seen um, elsewhere, uh, even when there's a universal health care um, system in place. I want to talk for a moment that uh, something that I'm sure we'll hear a lot of if there is a resurgence, and that is the recent protests across the country after uh, the death of George Floyd. Uh, our photographer, uh, Jesse Costa, captured a photograph from recent protests in Boston where you could see that they were not socially distancing, but although most of them were wearing masks, you could see there uh, as they protested uh, in an effort to try to, to be safe. Uh, but at the same time, we also have, uh, we have to understand we're also reopening, states are reopening and we are seeing uh, places, I know when I go for a walk, I see very few people with masks on. We've seen videos from Las Vegas of filled casinos with people not wearing masks. But starting with the protests, how much of a risk do you think that those protests uh, presented, particularly for people of color, uh, who are protesting racism in one system, but also being dramatically impacted by racism in another way with the pandemic. Dr. Johnson. Um, you know, it's, it's a hard question for me to answer because um, there is risk. There's risk. First of all, I wanna just say, I am glad that I think we have to take stock that the majority of the young people and the people we have seen out protesting are wearing masks, unlike what we saw in Florida on the beaches, unlike what we've seen in so many different surroundings. So let's take stock that that our, and it's a lot of young people, others, but a lot of you, they are taking this seriously. Uh, so I just wanna, you know, we have to start with what is the most positive aspect of this. But I think in this period of time, you know, there's some risk, but there's also a risk of not acting on the devastating circumstances on, in which we find ourselves, uh, in which we have disparities laid bare by a pandemic with the killing of men and women by police. And, you know, that has been continuous. So, you know, I have mixed feelings about it. I think that um, I'm proud of, of people who have been out there, our young people, everyone who's been out making their voices heard. I think it, it's having impact. Um, I'm proud that they're wearing masks. Um, I wish they were more socially distant, but, um, uh, you know, it's it's it's. I'm I'm hoping that we do not see outbreaks from this. Uh, Doctor, yeah, Doctor Bassett, you wrote an op-ed in the New York Daily News last week entitled "Racism is a Deadly Virus." Two of public health defense of these mass protests. Uh, tell us what you think about seeing this. Oh, you have to unmute. <laughs> oh, you're on mute, Doctor. Sorry, I have a, a clock that keeps ringing. So <laughs> if you've all heard it. <laughs> um, so I want to echo everything that that um, that Dr. Johnson just said that that I have we have to have respect for the fact that these uh, the people out there protesting and they include my own daughter um, are there because they're balancing the risk. And there's no doubt that uh, racism has been killing uh, people of color in this country, particularly people classified as black Americans, much longer than COVID-19. And they're taking uh, precautions. They're trying. I wish that the police would not force them into close quarters, would not detain them in uh, crowded holding cells. That would also be a, a good sign of respect for the need uh, to socially distance. And we'll see. Um, I, I, I think it's appropriate that they be offered testing, um, but I absolutely respect the decision that they've made that enough is enough. 
And I would just add to that, Kimberly, um, when uh, we were in the early phases of the coronavirus, I remember uh, many a heated debate uh, within uh, our home community, within the black community, uh, hearing from so many people that were afraid to wear masks. Um, we, we were beginning to learn how this was spread and how necessary it was for people to, in order to keep themselves safe and, and others, that they needed to wear masks. And people were afraid to wear masks uh, for fear of being racially profiled and their lives being in jeopardy. And so, it, again, it just speaks to the fact that the pre-existing condition here is racism. We are navigating a pandemic within a pandemic, the pandemic that is the coronavirus, which has disproportionately uh, hit uh, Black and Latinx communities. And, and also, um, all while um, dealing with the trauma of another pandemic, which is the scourge that is police brutality, born out of our original sin. And so, I even saw some reports that said that the statistics are, are greater that you would have a, an interaction with law enforcement uh, that would be negative or could cost you your life as a black person than contracting COVID-19. So people are weighing the risk. Um, I was also out there and I do maintain that there will be unrest in our streets for as long as there is unrest in our lives. And these uh, peaceful demonstrations uh, these mobilization efforts are completely shifting the national conversation and consciousness. Uh, these are intergenerational, multiracial movements mm -hmm. uh, at a time of acute pain and inflection point for our country. And it's why right now we are having a real conversation about how to reimagine um, how to keep our communities healthy and safe. It's why we're having a conversation about uh, restitution and reparations. It has everything to do. The, the rage is not only about the uh, killing, the brutal killing of another unarmed black man. It is about all of it. And so people are weighing that risk because we cannot return to a status quo normal. We are going to have to move differently as a society. I am Kimberly Atkins and this is WBUR's Town Hall on the disproportionate impact of the coronavirus pandemic on people of color. There's still time to submit a question. If you have one, you can go to slido.com and use event code WBURVTH9. Uh, now I want to turn to solutions, solutions for these disparities. And I think uh, I wanna start by the one thing that I as a journalist have, have heard more about than anything, and that is testing. Uh, let's talk about the role of testing. Uh, is it still as crucial as it was at the beginning of this pandemic? And where are we uh, with testing, Dr. Johnson? Uh, testing continues to be critically important and we are not where we need to be in terms of scaling up our testing. The state does have plans to, to scale up the, the testing, but um, it's it's important. It is urgent. We just talked about the protesters and having them have testing available. Um, you know, this is something that we remember. We started from so way behind, right? And so we have not yet caught up. But there is going to be testing necessary for how we think about not only symptomatic people, but contacts. And then what is the right kind of surveillance, which right now is really not covered by insurance, but for certain high risk groups, what does that look like? And how should we be thinking about that? And right now there really is no good guidance because mainly all the guidance has been based in scarcity and not in what might be good science. Dr. Bassett. I, you know, the whole testing uh, couldn't be, have been more bungled. I, I, I have to come back to, to, you know, noting that we have one of the most sophisticated and advanced uh, medical care systems and um, laboratory uh, systems in the world. And here we are having this conversation now six months into the U.S. pandemic. It really is quite staggering. And uh, we don't have uh, adequate testing available yet. Uh, additionally, we, we don't know the extent to which 
uh, this virus has spread in our population uh, because all the sources that we have are related to people who seek and obtain health care. And so we've all been all talking about the ways in which this gives us a distorted picture, uh, either too high, too low. Uh, and we are still without really, truly accurate data about where we stand. So um, we, we need testing, uh, and not just of people with symptoms, uh, but anybody who's been exposed should be able to get testing. And all of us know these terrible stories like the gra Wellesley graduate. Um, who wanted testing and wasn't able to obtain it. It's, it's just Dr. Bassett, really sort of, I just I, I yep. sort of myself Go ahead. comments and just wanted to say, you know, I'm in Washington right now and earlier today, um, we had a briefing in the oversight committee and it was damning, just very alarming. Um, you know, if you're not aware, um, in, in mid-March, the FDA issued a pathway D policy allowing junk tests to flood the market. Uh, no. tests that have not been reviewed or approved by the FDA. Correct. So we need more diagnostic testing. We need more antibody testing. Unfortunately, these antibody tests have a 51% chance of producing a false positive. So we just really have no idea where we are. And then we have a White House Coronavirus Task Force, which has even floated the idea of using antibody tests with immunity certificates as part of the plan to reopen our economy. So, you know, while antibody tests can be used to evaluate the potential exposure rate of a community, experts today warn that they should not be used for individual decision making to go back to work or as a rationale for businesses to reopen. So we're not, you know, there's serious concerns and questions around the integrity of this testing, but we need diagnostic testing, we need antibody testing, we need contact tracing. Um, and I would just add, that's one of the reasons why I fought so hard from the very beginning and um, am grateful that it was able to secure more robust funding for our community health centers because of the critical role that they play um, in providing access to health care for our most vulnerable, our low income, our seniors. Uh, they'll, they treat you regardless of economic status or immigration status uh, and also are, uh, operate with a great um, cultural competency. And once our community health centers were engaged as uh, field uh, testing, we, we were able to get uh, a better gauge on exactly where we are, but we've got, we've got a long way to go. I, I want we've to talk lost and, so and much direct trust. So much well, trust. You, anti you anticipated that where I was going to go, I said this dovetails uh, directly into the issue of mistrust. I want to play a little bit of sound for you. For you. It's from Michael Curry, who is former president of the Boston chapter of the NAACP uh, and a current board member, a board of director uh, member of the NAACP. And he was on uh, NP uh, WBUR's Radio Boston in April talking about the issue of mistrust of the healthcare system and implicit bias. Let's take a listen. The reality is, I don't trust our system to determine who dies and who lives because of implicit bias. And I think what I've heard in conversation with the Attorney General's office just this week with Mara Healy and Secretary Sutters and Health Human Services was experts in this field, Dr. Thea James over at BMC and others say, hey, we need to make sure there's diverse faces, diverse people at the table, LGBTQ, uh, people of color, people with disabilities to say, hey, that policy is not the right policy. That determination, a surge will impact our communities in a different way and we need you to put the resources in the right place. Congresswoman Presley, how do we get the right people at the table as we are coming up with these uh, plans for solutions? Well, you're just intentional about it. Um, you know, I mean, we see this with contract tracing, you know, we'll never hit the targets that we need to um, if we don't have trusted voices that are doing that contract tracing. It's not about, uh, you know, your uh, even being a diverse person or speaking the language. It's about being a trusted voice in that community, being well known. So we have to be intentional and deliberate. You know, this is um, why I was very vocal in my concerns about the original crisis care standards, which thank God we never had to use. But there were many blind spots there and that has everything to do with the lack of representation that was around the table of those communities that um, were, were the most impacted and represent the highest infection rates. Um, you know, so we just have to be intentional and deliberate. It does mean 20 more phone calls and maybe 100 more emails, but this is a matter of life and death. 
I yeah. want to ask uh, another Slido question that I want to send uh, that says you, you've spoken about racial issues with data in health research. Beyond research, what should hospital leaders do to address racial inequities in healthcare? We've been talking about uh, things in terms of legislation and other efforts, but Dr. Johnson, what do medical professionals need to do to address this? Well, you know, let's just start with data. Um, you know, hospitals keep very good data, but are they reporting in their routine reports? Are they reporting out data that is sex and race disaggregated so that they can actually understand their outcomes, um, what they are achieving or not achieving? So I would say that that's one of the first things. But I would say the second is I, I said it earlier that we have not really taken seriously the, the evaluation of what it means to try to tear down structural racism in our medical system, in our institutions, institution by institution. We live right now, we are, we're here in Massachusetts, we are in what some call the medical mecca, the science mecca of the United States. Um, we have centers that have looked at this, but to say that we have taken this on as a major initiative, a major cause across our institutions, that has not happened. And I think that is what it is going to take um, in order for us to really understand some of the deep rooted structures that need to be dismantled. And Dr. Johnson, I just wanna say thank you for um, making that point earlier that people can't be defensive. I think the immediate response by most is, well, I'm not racist. Right. And that is not the same thing as being uh, anti-racist in working deliberately and with intention. This right. does take will, it does take courage to dismantle structural racism. Right. And what has resulted in ostensibly systemic oppression across the board. Absolutely. You know, we have large academic medical centers filled with, with people not only providing care, but doing research. And each of us has a responsibility to actually think deeply about these issues and to edu be educated about all of the influences that impact health and disease. And you know, one of the things we were talking about testing, one of the things I'm particularly worried about is we think about what comes next in terms of a vaccine. How are we thinking about the evaluation of vaccines? Do we have the right people reaching out and working with communities of color to build trust, to make sure they are included so that we have data on safety for different populations? I think this is gonna be critical as we think about what happens down the line and the trust different groups are gonna have as to whether or not they are going to participate in what is potentially preventative. Dr. Bassett, do you think that the right people in the healthcare, public health and medical field are, are at the table to make these, these points that, that uh, Congresswoman Presley and, and Dr. Johnson are making? Well, they, I mean, the Centers for Disease Control has sort of been missing in action. If I wanna get a daily briefing on where we stand with uh, with COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, I tune into the World Health Organization, which is, you know, uh, more than ironic. So uh, this has been a bad run for the status of public health. It should have been an example of how public health, uh, you know, shines and, uh, and helps drive an appropriately crafted response. Instead, we've seen, you know, wild claims, denigration of science um, uh, from the highest levels of our government. And apparently, uh, you know, the uh, public health voices and science voices, you know, are not being particularly consulted anymore. Now, can you blame uh, people for feeling like, should they trust what's going on? Um, I, I'm very worried about that. Dr. Johnson has said, will people trust? Uh, a, a government which has gone, uh, you know, full force deregulation and letting all kinds of test result test kits flood the market, you're going to trust them to develop a well uh, evaluated vaccine. Um, you know, there have been missteps with vaccines in in the past, and I'm very worried that communities uh, will 
you know, that already have reasons to mistrust uh, may not want to participate. You know, uh, in the, the the press conference that I played a clip from of Dr. Fauci, he also compared the current moment uh, to the AIDS crisis in the uh, 70s and 80s and how that impacted uh, the LGBTQ community the mm -hmm. same way the coronavirus is impacting communities of color. But he made the point that uh, that served uh, as an opportunity to raise awareness about the issue, not just in terms of health, but overall about uh, the civil rights uh, fight of LGBTQ people. Do you think this also is a moment that the awareness uh, can be drawn to this issue so that once the coronavirus is over, the attention still stays at the health disparities that exist otherwise uh, between people of color and, and those who are not? Well, I think that decision is being made by the people who are on the streets and I'm with them, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I just think that this is something I've worked in public health for over 30 years and I haven't seen uh, this type of mass mobilization saying that, you know, that this has been centuries in the making and it has to stop. It was made by people and uh, these, uh, you know, these disparities, and it can be fixed by people. And um, right. so I don't think that it's really going to be a technical issue. This is a political issue. And I'm, I'm very proud of uh, the way in which it's been grasped with both hands by so many young people. And I would just add to that, that, you know, these disparities, um, to the doctor's point, they're man-made, but they were codified in policy in lawmaking. The reason why there is a, um, a racial wealth gap um, that is, is so damning uh, in the city of Boston has everything to do uh, with policy. The reason why that there is a, um, such a disparity when it comes to life expectancy, um, to, to median household wealth, has everything to do with lawmaking. Um, and that's why we have to be anti-racist in our lawmaking. This herd was precise, it was targeted through discriminatory and draconian uh, lawmaking. And so if we can legislate disproportionate hate, hurt, and harm onto uh, communities of color, then we can also legislate healing and justice. And that is addressing these issues holistically. It's telling the truth about the disproportionate burden of black student debt on, on black uh, households, of uh, the need for housing as a human right, of uh, people working at a living wage, of universal health care, of Medicare for all. You know, I could, I could go on and on enumerating these things. But the point is that the, the point is to be prescriptive and to be prescriptive in our lawmaking. And, and Dr. Johnson, you, you get the you get the last word here. I just want to get back. You know, you use the example that Dr. Fauci used of HIV, uh, and obviously Dr. Bassett has deep experience here. Yes, it began, began and caused a huge awakening and movement amongst the LGBTQ population, mm -hmm. but it really ended up being a, a major uh, disease in the minority population, in black and brown populations. And we forget that. And so this time, let's not let that happen again. Let's not, let's not waste this crisis, and I do think what we're seeing um, in our streets, what we're seeing in the halls of Congress, the waking up, the moving forward. I think um, I, we are hopeful. All right, well, we'll have to leave it there, but thank well, you so much, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Congresswoman Presley, and thank you, Dr. Bassett, for this discussion. And thanks to you, our audience, for joining us on this live stream. Uh, you can join WBUR reporter Zeninjor Equimeka on Tuesday, June 16th for our next virtual town hall, Health Before Profits, Businesses Step Up During COVID-19. 
Sanenjor will be joined by Romina Bianjavani, Global Head of Communications for New Balance, Jane Carpenter, uh, Global Head of Communications for Wayfair, and Wambi Rose, co-founder and CEO of Love Pop. All those companies pivoted their normal operations to contribute to the coronavirus response effort. You can register and find out how to submit your questions ahead of the event at WBUR.org slash events. Thank you for joining us and stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Don't forget about the incarcerated and the homeless, please. Yes. Thank you.